And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is actor and author Jack W. Gregory, also known as the Accidental Journalist, who had an NDE and went to hell for four minutes, and today we're going to learn about it. Jack, thank you for joining me, and welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's it's good to be here. Well, if you don't mind, let's just start with your NDE and go from there. Yeah, so I think before I start with my NDE, I should tell you a little bit about my life before. Sure. Um, My whole life, I've struggled with um, addiction and uh, mental illness. Uh, and abandonment issues. I was told on my eighth birthday by my mum that I was adopted, um, and that set me up for a certain way of life. So my whole life I spent skating um, in the darkest parts of Britain, um, kind of outside the periphery of normal life. Um, Spent a lot of time with gangsters and, um, you know, bare knuckle fighting, lots of drugs, um, crime. Uh, I began to build my life back up um, after my marriage ended in 2010. Um, And I spent a couple of years trying to get into the film and uh, I ended up drinking again and back on the drugs. Inevitably, it led me to homelessness uh, addicted to uh, crack cocaine, uh, amongst other um, substances. And on the 26th of June, uh, 2014, I found myself in a crack house about 10 o'clock at night, sat on the floor, back against the wall with a crack pipe in hand. And um, this is one of the times I, I, I just, I couldn't live with my, life anymore i'd pretty much lost everything i'd lost my kids um lost all respect in my town um that i'd built up over years um so i sat on this floor of this crack house and i said god i don't even know if you exist but if you do um either take my life or take away this hunger take away this thirst uh, for drugs um, and I don't know if you know anything about crack cocaine, but the last thing you want to do is sleep. But um, I fell asleep. And I woke up around about four minutes past 12 um, a.m. on the 27th of June, 2014, and I haven't used the day since. So I've always kind of had a... God's been on and off in my life for most of my life. I was brought up in a small town anyway, um, a small mining town in, in a place called Yorkshire, which is, the, you know, north of England, um, you know, a couple of hours away from, two or three hours away from Scotland. Um, so, you know, it's, um, you know, when the mines closed and everybody lost their jobs, it came down to... Um, a, a lot of people dropped into a lot of poverty. So I was kind of used to that. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd i been in and out of church as a kid and experimented with lots of different um, religions, uh, Buddhism and Islam. I've got family that are uh, Muslim and, um, you know, Nothing really sort of sat with me, but I always had a concept of God. You know, I went to my first ever AA meeting at 14 years old. So it shows you sort of how my head was. But I've done a lot of bad things in my life, and I've hurt a lot of people. Watched my best friend throw himself in front of a train when I was 20, um, which absolutely broke me. I've lost my friend to murder. Um, He was stabbed in the throat with a, a bottle outside the nightclub. Um, And that was before I was 18. So, you know, drugs and violence were were my life. Um, And I tried to lead a normal life away from that. And I did for quite a while. Um, But 
you know, I always ended up, you know, I had 10 years, um, 12 years clean and sober, and then I fell back into it. I'm currently at eight years, one month, um, and I haven't even had a desire to use because uh, God took that away. But I'd started building my life back up. Uh, I'm, I turned up at a food bank. This is why I, you know, kind of, I ended up back in that crack house. But it, this, this was the event that set it all off for me. I went to a food bank on a Friday morning when I was homeless um, because they were serving hot coffee and cake. Um, and they were nice and the Christians were nice and, you know, occasionally they would buy you cigarettes and stuff. And I got talking to this lady that served me coffee. She liked my Doctor Who t-shirt that I had on. Um, and we just got talking and, and she took me for lunch, but despite being told I was bad, bad news, but she took me for lunch and, um, bought me tobacco and bought me food and just really sort of treated me nice. Um, incidentally, we married in 2019, um, you know, so I started building my faith up. I started going to church. I moved in with her in around the October, um, November time. Um, I wasn't very heavy. I, I was quite skinny. Um, and in February, 2015, um, I think it was, uh, February the Ninth, I think, I became very ill. Um, it it felt like I had a fist um, in my abdomen, so I went to hospital, and you know, they just found like that. They said it could be my gallbladder, but I'd have to wait. You know, they they found some bits and bobs of um, infection, so they they treated that, and they sent me on my way. Um, March the 14th, 2015, I'd start, no, March the 9th, sorry. I started feeling very, very ill a few days before. Um, I was shaking so hard that I would go about a foot off the bed at times. Um, I couldn't breathe properly. Every time I tried to breathe, it felt like I had silver in my throat. Um, I would sweat so hard that it would, the bedding would feel like that I'd wet myself. I got my daughter on the Friday from her mom's after school to bring her home for the weekend. Um, I'd walked about a hundred yards and I lost all my, every single bit of air just came out of my lungs. It was like, oh, and I had to sit down. I couldn't breathe. Didn't want to scare her. Managed to gain my composure. Um, I was surviving on prayer and paracetamol. Um, the next morning I felt better than I felt in quite a while. Um, and the say, you know, I, I've been told that you know, when you're ready to um, step off this mortal coil, you'll get new energy and stuff like that. And I did. I I didn't think anything of it. I felt better. I took the kids out, five kids, um, you know, and um, managed a bacon sandwich I hadn't eaten for days. Um, I weighed at that time probably about 93, 94 pounds. Um, I'm six foot one, by the way. Um, so um, I'd, I'd managed to get a bacon sandwich down and I started feeling better. And then about six o'clock in that, that evening, I started feeling worse again. Um, I didn't sleep all night. Um, just popping uh, paracetamol, ibrofen, um, trying to drink. Um, and Sunday morning, I rang my ex-wife and said, look, can you come and get our daughter? Because I'm going to have to call an ambulance. She said, well, if you can wait a couple of hours, I'll come and get you. Um, and, you know, I'll get our daughter and we'll drop you off at the hospital and you can give your daughter a kiss and a cuddle. She was about f five or six at the time. And give her a kiss and a cuddle and she'll know that you're going to be all right. So um, um, we did that and... 
I guess I got there around about half past three. Um, yeah, this was on the ninth and about half past three. And um, I was I was sat in A and E, and they, you know, they put me out the back, and they could see that I, I was obviously in distress. By half past seven, I was dead. Um, I had type two lung failure. Um, tuberculosis that I'd had for some time. I just put it off as a cough because of the life that I'd lived. Um, tuberculosis, my lungs were scarred so badly that they were in danger of just going down anyway. I had pleurisy, I had double pneumonia, um, some environmental disease that they hadn't seen in about 40 years. And um, I was just, I remember laying there and having this almighty urge to confess my sins. I don't know why. And I'd asked them for some paper. I'd gone mute. They'd never, they had never seen this before. I went completely mute. Um, and then it went black. And it felt like I'd been asleep. And I it was I was in the hospital room. It's called the negative pressure room. So the um they're pumping clean air into the room, every bit of, um, you, you know, every time you have any interaction with anybody, they're in full contagion suits. Scary thing. You know, this was like pre, pre, pre COVID. So, you know, it, it was dark. And then I remember being in the hospital room and it was kind of like, There was a darkness over my eyes. It was kind of like a, like a old eighties, nineties film grain. Um, I still had this sort of silver taste in my chest and in my throat. And I remember just walking around the room and into the bathroom and I, I don't even remember opening the door. The door was heavy. It was a heavy door. I don't even remember opening the door. And I remember walking around the ward and it just seemed so dark. And there were all these noises going about, but I wasn't, wasn't sure what they were. So I'm, I'm walking around and then the next thing I find myself back in the room back in the bed and I hadn't left. I wasn't able to walk. I'd lost 50% of my muscle mass. Um, I wouldn't eat. Um, at my worst, I was about 80 pounds. Um, lost all my muscle, lost all the strength. Um, the infect, I had an infection in my mouth. Um, so I couldn't eat anyway because it was just so painful. I had these painful blisters in my mouth. But I remember being back in the back in the bed, and there was this noise, and it sounded like a an air raid siren. Sort of like a and in, in between you'd get the odd beat. Um and outside there was noises. And there was a, a figure with his back to the wall by the door, just out of my periphery. And I knew I was in hell. Purgatory or what you want, everyone you want to call it. And I must have been, you know, in, in retrospect, I must have been in and out of consciousness 
in life and death. The nearly lost me a few few times. Um, I was right next to the uh, helipad of the hospital. And people from my life were outside of the door, so I didn't see them. I couldn't see them, but I could hear them. So I was being, all these people were being brought in. Um, and I was being judged for every lie that I'd ever told, for every punch that I'd ever thrown, for every crime that I'd ever done, for every drink I'd ever drunk, for every drug I'd ever taken. I was being judged. Um, they, they were, I don't know whether they were demons or, or what, but, you know, it was family and friends outside this door, um, holding a kangaroo car, banging on a table saying, you know, deciding what to do to me, what punishment to give to me. Um, I didn't, I couldn't speak. I was mute. I tried to speak. I couldn't. Um, I felt people coming in the room and laughing and then walking out. And it was just so. Heartbreaking. I think, you know, it's probably a better word, but, it, you know, I was broken. Um, through it all, I felt two figures, the one by the door with his back against the wall, and there was one at the end of my bed. Um, and it wasn't the one with the back against the wall that annoyed me. It was the one at the end of my bed because it felt kind of peaceful. And the last thing I wanted was peace because I felt I deserved to be judged for everything I'd ever done, every person that I'd ever hurt. Every fight that I'd ever had, every scar that I'd got, you know, they were being counted and I was being judged. And all in all, I, I, for the main bit, I was in there for just over four minutes. But it felt like weeks. It felt like weeks. Um, and my mind was so fragile when I was brought back. I became convinced I'd caused the apocalypse with this super virulent form of tuberculosis. I thought I'd caused a pandemic because people that were coming in were in all contagion stuff. Um, there were people from my church coming to visit me. Um, and when I did speak, it was of hate and screaming and swearing and spitting and lashing out. The lead elder of the church that I've been going to for months came to pray for my soul because they were going to lose me again. I believe I went back into, I believe I passed away again. Um, and was brought back quite quickly. Um, these are all flashes and these are all things that I'm able to look at now in retrospect, but I believed I'd caused this apocalypse. I believed I deserved to die. Um, they'd given me this drug that felt like LSD. And they'd given me another drug that helps fight infection, but it was a genetic form of the drug. So my mind broke and I, they moved me into another bed, into another part of uh, another ward, which was the um, critical care unit. Um, and when they put me on the bed and they um, put the cover over me, it had a towel. Uh, you know, like, like green or blue paper towels. Um, and it had that underneath the, um, on, underneath the bed sheet. Um, and the drug that I was on had, had 
caused me to get a really painful rash from just under my chin to down to my, excuse me, my waist. And it burned. Um, I remember the nurse saying, just look at the wall, you'll be fine. You know, some people say they see animals in there, you know, it's nice, just let it. But I just, I started to panic and I had this bad trip and it was just awful, awful. I, I was burning. Um, it was the most painful. I can, I can take a decent amount of pain. I'm accustomed to that, but this was the most painful thing I'd ever felt. It was literally like I had acid on my chest and it burned and it itched and it hurt. Um, and I couldn't scream. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't speak. And all the time, this figure was at the bottom of my bed. Um, I remember this one doctor that would come in and she was the only Asian doctor. And, um, you know, I've, 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 I've spoken to some of your guys, you, you know, especially you live in the deep south there, you, you know, your doctors are allowed to pray with you. That's illegal here. Mm. You can lose your license for that. You can't even wear a cross over your uniform. You can wear it under uniform as long as you don't show it. But I remember this young lady being in, and nobody remembers her. I remember being in there and the cross would catch my eye and she'd smile. And then when somebody was, was going to come in, she'd just cover it up again. And this happened a few times. And I'm told that people from my church came in and I that there was times where I was able to speak to them normally and it seemed normal. But all this time I was going through this mental battle. They, um, they were going to section me at one point uh, under the Mental Health Act, um, force me to eat, force a, a tube down my throat I, because I wouldn't. So I thought they were poisoning the food with my own blood. Um, this is how broken my mind was. But this person at the end of my bed, he never really left. Um, and I guess this went on for a couple of weeks. Um, in and out of hell or purgatory, whatever you want to call it. Uh, not able to sleep, not able to be awake, kind of in a, a limbo at times. And this thing at the end of my bed, and I went, all right, okay. I'm, I'm going to have to address this elephant in the room. Who are you? And I heard his voice saying, I think I know who you think you know who I am. And I'm like, all right then. What have I got to do? He's like, you know what you've got to do. So I went, okay. Jesus. I'll call you by your name. Jesus. And as I said, Jesus, that thing from outside of my periphery, that person by the door, gone. I said, I accept you. I accept you into my life. And it was literally like this film fell away from my eyes. It was like trying to watch a dark program on a small device in a dark room. And then suddenly clicking into HD. And the nurse came in and she went white because I smiled at her. And I said, can I have a wash? And she ran out and she, there was a bit of chaos outside. And the doctor came in. Um, they got the consultant. And he's like, this is miraculous. What, what on earth has happened? I said, I want to wash. So he said, okay, I'll ask, you know, he sent the nurse to get a, a, a bowl so I could get myself washing. You know, bearing in mind, I still had this 
rash from neck to waist. And she brought it in and she brought in a sponge. And there's this doctor's checking me over. I'm giving myself a wash, washing my arms under my arms, and I start washing my chest. And it just starts to peel away. As the doctor stood there watching white, this rash, this burning rash that felt like acid, just washed away underneath a sponge and just started to disappear. Um, I don't think they knew what was happening. Um, I said I was hungry. Um, I managed some jelly. They gave me something for the things in my mouth so I could, it, it kind of numbed them so I could eat. I had to learn to eat again and swallow and things like that. And um, within a day, I was up and walking on two walking sticks. Um, the doctor has never, as he said, he'd never seen anything like this in his life. Just to see someone go like that, just change in front of his eyes. Um, there were people from my church bringing me in sweets and bottles of pop and tins of spam. Um, you've never smelled anything like a whole hospital ward smelling of spam because the nurses are so happy that you're eating, they're cooking it for you. Um, I'd had a job before I, I got put in there. Um, I got made redundant while I was in there, so I got a little bit of money. I decided to um, invest that into getting a bit of weight on, you know. Like I say, I was about 80 pounds. Um, they said that I, uh, which is about six stone, six ounces. Um, they said that um, I could go home if I reached eight stone. So within two weeks um, from eating my breakfast, and an hour later going down to the canteen for a second breakfast, then coming back and eating sweets all morning and having my dinner, an hour later going down for a second dinner, and then the same all the way through the day, and then tea time, having my tea. Um, and then on a night, there was a, a local pizza shop that did two for one uh, for £9.99. So I would get two 12-inch pizzas, one for me and one for the nurses. Um... And within a couple of weeks, I built myself up to eight, eight stone six. Um, I had Jesus in my life. I, I began to pray and, you know, went back to my, you, they let me out and I went back to the church and, you know, I found out that they'd, they'd been praying for me every week. They had my picture up on the screen and they would pray for me. They thought they were going to lose me, and they did a couple of times. I would keep having these recurring nightmares, like I was back there, like I was back in hell. It would start with darkness, and then it would be wherever I was, not necessarily the um, uh, hospital room, but, you know, maybe my town, and it was... Hell wasn't hot. It wasn't full of ashes. It didn't smell of sulfur. It was dark and soul draining. It was heavy on your heart. Um, and I don't think I ever appreciated my life until I went to hell. It gave me a whole new look upon life I don't want to go back there you know I gave my life to God um, a big part of my church and you know I wrote a book about it um, from what I remembered in uh, around about 2016 
Um, and it's only over these past few years that I've been able to look at it and deal with the trauma um, and really sort of dig deep into my psyche to try and get better that I've been able to, in, in retrospect, learn about all the things that happened and how they affected me. Um, because remember me telling you about the, uh, the, the sound that I heard that sounded like an air aid um, thing that was going off every so often. And I was convinced that there was a million, that that was a million people dead. I became convinced that bodies were piling up outside the hospital, inside the hospital. Anybody that came to visit me and stood outside the hospital door, their hearts were just given out and they were dying um, of just shock at the realization that I'd caused the end of the world. You know. And there are people that will dispute and they will say, oh, it's, it's just was what happens and they put, try and put it down to DMT. Um, I'm not an irrational man. Um, I had my beliefs and I know what happened to me and I know in my heart that I went to hell. And I know I don't ever want to go back there. I don't ever want anybody to go there. It was a personal hell. A few months later, after I was let out, I decided to get baptized in my church. And this was when my church was being run by from a school hall, a local high school hall on a Sunday. And um, my wife and kids came to the church with me. And there was four or five of us getting baptized at the same time. Just one guy called Will. Um, you know, one of the younger members of the church, like six foot seven, six foot, foot eight, really tall lad. And as we walked into the church, my wife just gave me a tap on the shoulder and she said, uh, look over there. And I looked and there staring at my face was a specialist doctor from the hospital that had come in and saw this miracle happen. And he was there because his son, Will, was getting baptized. Now, some people can put that down to coincidence. Some people put it down to just being a bit weird. Um, I put it down to all being part of God's plan. Um, I've been to hell. I don't want to go back there. Um, whether I get to heaven or not, I, that's not for me to say, but my life is not what it was. I'm a completely different man to who I was. Um, I have a friendship with my ex-wife. I, I see my daughter on a regular basis. She comes to my house and spends time with me and uh, my wife and my children. Um, I've got a career in consultation in film you know i've worked on two hollywood films that were paid for by martin scorsese uh, that were based in england uh, the souvenir part one and part two um, i had a small part in that and i also consulted because i because of the life that i'd lived i've been very blessed to be able to consult on several other programs and play characters of addicts and serial killers and things like that in uh, various film and TV. Um, in 2017, I decided that I needed to tackle my past and look at some of the traumas that I'd never looked at before. So I spent six months working with escapees of human and sexual slavery and exploitation. Because when I was 12 years old, I was brought up in the special school system. There was no real such thing in the 80s as 
dyslexia. Um, you know, there was, but they, you know, it, it, they just put you down as a bit thick. So they put you into the special school system. But I always had a brain and I always had a head for words. You know, um, I had this mind where, you know, mo most people would look at a wall or look at the sky and, they, you know, they'd see some beauty. All I'd ever want to do was write on it. I couldn't really write until I was 21. I learned in prison, but, you know, I just wanted to print words on it. Um, and I was really abused in, in, in that system. Um, these were demons that I had for them in my whole life. These were things that I couldn't face. So by standing head on uh, and talking to these men, courageous men and women, I found the courage to stand up and be counted and say, talk about my story, finally. I released the book Between Streetlights and Red Lights. And I started to heal. Um, November 2020, when... No, October 2020, September, October 2020, when um, lockdown happened, COVID and lockdown, and it all kind of felt familiar and a bit scary and a bit, I didn't know what to do. I All I could do was watch 80s and 90s films all day. As you can see, I've got big affinity for films. And my friend, Jason, who is a, hostage negotiator by trade he said you like to talk you like to share your story you like to share other people's stories why don't we do a podcast so we did and people liked it so i got a friend of mine who's uh british was british uh boxed in um licensed and licensed champion um he did one and we got several thousand views and then i did another one with a campaigner and then we got a uh, a, a guy that uh, a TV presenter over here who uh, I don't know if you've heard of a, a program called Haunted but they get um, ex-coppers and they get them um, chasing down members of the public who go on the run uh, he, he was an undercover policeman in his day so I got him on uh, and that sort of blew me up I fell into journalism by accident so i became the accidental journalist um i started producing these things in my shed which we are now um and yeah i guess i've been sort of blessed ever since jack thank you for sharing your experience with us during your nde when you were in that kangaroo court as you described it and all these people from your past were with you were those people that were still alive or people who had already crossed over to the other side? Most of them were still alive. Through it all, there was one voice of reason of my niece, Haley, And I hadn't seen her really. I, I don't go back to Yorkshire very much. It's not a comfortable place for me. Um, I hadn't seen her for a long time, you know. Um, I left when she was about four or five and I had all that guilt on me. She loved me. I loved her. She was my world, my absolute world. And I had this guilt sat on me, but she was the only one that was saying, well, you know, they were voting on whether to end my life quickly or not or let me go on living. And I guess it was kind of like the sound of the lunch trolleys and, you know, the metal, like metal cases. Um, and kind of what you would hear was, and it was kind of, you know, like a fist against the metal. And they were judging me for every lie that I'd ever, like I say, every lie that I'd ever told. You know, I was a con man for a long time. I was a very good one. And I made a lot of money for a lot of people. 
I was good at, I, I could hold a um, character for a long time. I was good at different accents and mimicking people and I was good at remembering. So I felt like I was being judged for every lie that I'd ever told and everything that I'd ever done bad. Um, and I felt like she was the only one that wanted me to live. Um, and in between, you'd hear the helicopters landing and taking off. I guess because I, I was kind of in and out of consciousness. Um, I believe that when you're in such an infirm state that when you're so close to death, I don't think it matters whether you're alive or dead. I think you transcend between heaven and hell or between hell and um, reality. Um, sorry. And um, yeah, it was, I don't know. You mentioned that you were giving a medication that was similar to LSD. Yeah. Is there any chance that this experience was due to that medication? No, no. I was told that it would make me see animal faces in the wall. Um, I forget the name of the drug now, but I have friends that are doctors and surgeons and, um, you know, they've said basically what they gave me was bleach and a needle. Um, yes, it affected what I saw. Um, you know, uh, I was convinced that I was in a secret part of the hospital on the fourth floor. Now, they're not, they're not four floors in the Norwich and Norfolk hospital i was convinced that there was a secret fourth floor that was run by the elite the illuminati the police or whatever you want to call it um i believe that i was very broken i was very messed up but i know that these things that happened although they became very profound in my life and they're still very profound in my life, that I went to hell. That wasn't a hallucination. Yes, the apocalypse afterwards and what was happening when they gave me the drug to try and push the infection out, which was after I went to hell, um, caused my mental breakdown, spiritual breakdown. Um, physical breakdown but I wasn't on that drug when I was in hell and I went to hell did you speak to Jesus after you left hell or was it Jesus who helped you get out of hell I believe that Jesus was there I don't I, I'm I'm not sure he was in hell I know I was in hell um but when I came out of hell, he never left the end of my bed to the point of my utter annoyance because I knew there was someone there, but I really couldn't communicate. And it's only when I said, all right, who are you? And he's like, well, you know who I am. You know, he, he didn't say, it's me, Jesus. You know, it, it didn't happen like that. I, I knew instantly who he was. I knew his voice. I didn't see his face. Um, I saw a ethereal sort of body at the end of the bed that kind of came out of the, you know, came into my main sight. Um but that was after I'd been to hell. I believe he was there to comfort me, um, to bring me back, and because he didn't want me to go back there. I don't want me to go back there. It sounded like when you said the name Jesus, somebody else at the door or in the room immediately left. If that's correct, do you think that was some kind of demon or dark spirit? I think it was either a demon or it was Satan 
um, himself that was stood by the door that was because I don't believe that Satan judges you out loud he judges you silently um, he didn't show himself I knew he was there I felt him I I guess I kind of heard his sort of ethereal breath his snigger his judgmental giggle which I can, I can only call it you know it wasn't a full-on um evil laugh but it was yeah i mean whether it was satan whether it was a an, another demon um you know i believe that the young doctor that came in i believe she was an angel um, nobody remembers her at all um i believe that god was in it and jesus was in it all the way um i believe that i was miraculously healed but the lessons that i'd learned in that four minutes that felt like four months but then went on for another couple of weeks while my mind um began to repair um and it was only when i i can only call it miraculous there is no way that i should have lived through that i've been told by the doctor i've been told by the nurse you know, you know the nurse that was my uh, is now a, a dear dear friend um the head nurse um I shouldn't have got out of that hospital room. I should have died. Would it be safe Fully. to say, would it be accurate to say that Jesus healed you? Yeah, it would be accurate to say that Jesus set me back into focus, brought me back into a real life. He, he healed the, um, the, uh, the rash, um, I call it a rash. It literally did feel like I'd been burned by acid, um, you know. And my wife will um, tell you that, you know, she'll tell anybody that there's no way that it should have disappeared just like that under a um, under a sponge. You know, it just peeled away, just mm. left. That's a miracle to me. Um, me speaking, not being mute, that was a miracle. we have been brought back from hell. And even though I went through hell in my own mind after that, um, in thinking that I'd lost everybody, it's a miracle that only took a couple of weeks to get my mind back. Um, it's a miracle that I put on over a stone in less than two weeks. You know, I have to stop you there because I don't know that what that means. You put on a stone. A uh, stone is. You know, I'm assuming you put on some weight. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's about thirteen pound. A stone. I think stone's about thirteen pound. Could be wrong. Um, I went from uh, sort of like eighty. I I guess eighty two pound 80 82 pound to over 90 pound so yeah um I've, I've explained this on american podcasts before and an australian one so it, it's kind of you know trying to work out the difference between right yeah right that's okay i mean i heard you say it before and i wasn't really sure i mean i figured that's what it was but we came to a point where there was just a break in conversation, so I just figured I'd ask. <laughs> yeah, and no, I think it's about thirteen pounds, something like that. Have you noticed after this experience that you have any psychic or psychic like abilities that you didn't have prior? I've always had sort of an affinity for words and um but I guess I'm, I'm about 
part of my church, um, part of it is this uh, thing called the School of Supernatural Life. Um, and that teaches us to li basically live how Jesus lived and look at uh, spiritual gifts like prophecy and things like that. Not forcing it, but learning it and learning to listen to God and learning to sort of feel God in our lives and learning, you know, just to skate alongside God and, and know what he's saying and asking him. For, we do this thing called treasure hunting where we um, sit and we pray and then we write some, uh, you know, we ask for pictures and we ask for names and then we go out in the town and, you know, somebody will have drawn, I'd, uh, written like red coat, tree, bag uh and we've met someone wearing a red coat with a bag we've spoken to her because we thought oh well this is you know this this is almost oh we need his tree and it turned you know she um she was basically getting out of a really difficult relationship and she was kind of on the run and she was at the bus station and you know, she didn't really have a lot of money. She didn't have enough money to get to her mum's. Um, and it turns out that the guy that she was running from, his nickname was Tree. Mm. So it's learning to listen to God and ask him for pictures. So I get a lot of pictures and um, whiz, we ask for wisdom. Um, yeah, and I, I guess, we, you know, it's because we put it into practice every Sunday and I'm on the prayer ministry team and various other teams and you know we pray with people and we just learn to become sort of one with God really and and, and, and know his voice and know the difference between his voice and what's not his voice and what's our voice and what might be the voice of the enemy um because he does sometimes pretend to be God, but you kind of know the difference. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, so I'm learning a bit about prophecy and speaking in tongues and um, uh, translating tongues, which is something that really blew my mind. Um, you know, I've, I've personally witnessed uh, somebody start speaking in tongues and somebody translate it and then afterwards they've walked up to them and said how do you know my language i i you know i, I came from a small village in africa only just several thousand people know this language how do you know this language how, how did you know this language to be able to interpret it and what they heard was tongues and and, and they asked for discernment and, and to listen and and you know they were able to trans later i've seen healings i've seen um uh you know and uh, i know know a guy that was going to lose his tongue he had a an abscess at the back of his mouth so bad that they were going to take his tongue out a few days later he walked into the building this is after being on crutches walking into the building and not no longer needing them um he was prayed for he was going to lose his tongue um, he couldn't speak properly. Um, I suppose about an hour into the morning, opened his mouth, showed his tongue to one of the lead elders, and it was gone. Hmm. Totally gone. He was able to speak, didn't need the thing taken away. I've, I've personally seen people healed of cancer, brain tumours, also lost people to cancer and brain tumors and things like that you know it's not all been love and light in in my sobriety and in my new life it's you know um in 2017 um the good friday my real mum went into hospital um easter sunday she died of cancer um, and pneumonia. Um, and then two months later, my sister had a baby um, and at two days old, um, baby Luna was beaten to death by her father. Um, out of rage, he was 
sent to prison for life with a minimum of 10 years. Um, and nine months into his sentence, he was murdered by his cellmate. So I've seen acts of violence as well. Um, you know, my family's been under some stress that I can't even begin to explain. But my life is so different and it's so God-led that I deal with it. I haven't, had, I haven't had a drink or a drug in eight, over eight years, one month. I haven't really had a desire to have a drink or a drug. That was kind of taken away from me. Mm -hmm. um, I've had using dreams where they felt really real. But I've prayed that away. I've had dreams where, I've, like I said, where I've, where I've felt like I've been back in hell. Do you feel that you've fully processed and integrated this experience or you're still processing it? I think I'm still processing it. I'm still learning. Uh, I'm in the process of writing another book about it, but basically everything that I've told you today, because my first book was a mixture of my, all the way through my life, I, um, you know, I've had a head for poetry and I've written poetry. So, you, you know, the, the first book of Personal Apocalypse was the poetry that I've written through my life and the explanation of some of them and some of the stories. And, you know, um, I've been blessed in some of the people that I met earlier on in my life. Um, you know, when I had sobriety, a bit of sobriety, um, you know, I sang for George Michael hmm. uh, in his hotel room and I shared a joint with him and um, I've done uh, magic tricks with some of the best magicians in the world. I was adding affinity for magic. Um, you know, I've met some great people through my life, but I've also met some people that have wanted to drag me down drag me back into you know and there are people that say you can't teach an old dog new tricks or you know um you know all the cliche things like you know a leopard can't change its spots well no a leopard can't change its spots because that is a physical transformation but what a leopard can do you can teach a leopard to be tamer you know you can teach a, a, a leopard to be comfortable around people. I wasn't comfortable around people. People hated me for a long time. Even when I got first sober, people didn't want to listen to me. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. I want to talk to him. He's a bad, bad dude. And I was for a long time, and I, I hated myself. And I think that's one of the reasons why it affected me so hard when I was in hell. That self-hate because that, that is one thing that the devil will grab onto and he will try and it's like a disease he will push it through um you know yeah. i live with, i live with illness every day i have multiple cirrhosis um you know other things um uh the when i died and stopped breathing and stuff uh i ended up with hypoxia due to lack of oxygen in my brain so i still have a what they call a, a brain injury but and trauma um my memory isn't always great and i you know i, I can forget i put something down away i've put it instantly um i have what's called um an emotional eidetic memory which means that i can recall things that have affected me emotionally with great detail. Um, I never had that before. Um, looking back at it, now I can rem remember exactly what my um, my adopted mum was wearing when she sat me on her knee. I can remember the exact date, 13th of May, um, 1985, my... Um, my eighth birthday. Um, 
I can remember exactly what my dad was wearing, what he was reading, um, the look over his glasses. I can remember the living room in great detail. Um, you know, events like that, their HD, some, there are some events that are still a bit fuzzy. Um, some events that I, I'm still trying to work out what happened and, and things like that. But for the most part of it, all of the um, major traumas in my life, I can remember like it was it, full on 4K on the big cinema screen, um, you know, and there's no getting away from that. And I get scared about it sometimes, but I have to remember I asked for that because I asked God to give me discernment. I asked God to give me um, ways to cope. I asked God to give me these gifts to help me learn these gifts of prophecy, to help me speak to other people, to connect to other people. You know, I don't see church as a, you know, there's a lot of people around here that see church as a, a gallery for goodness where people go to learn to be good. I don't go to church to learn to be good. I go to church because I was broken and church is a hospital for broken people. Um, I'm not a God botherer, <laughs> you know, uh, despite what, you know, people might think. I, I talk about my faith a lot. Um, you know, I do a lot of uh, gangland podcasts as well, where I speak to gangsters that were worse than me. Um, but the one thing that unites a lot of us is faith. Well, a lot of us found Jesus. Um, and we found redemption in that. Um you know, uh, there are people that have said that Christianity was the easy way out for me. It's not easy. Being a man of faith isn't easy because I have to be, um, I have to be honest. I have to be open. I have to be willing. Um, and not close minded. I have to. I feel that if we, if we've lived a certain life, if we've gone through certain events, we have a duty to teach. And even if you can't teach, teach. Speak. Tell people the roads you went down. Do you think that's your purpose in life now? Um... My purpose in life is to be a voice for others. Um, that's the discernment I was given. Um, I was told that I was going to change the entertainment business uh, and bring God into it. Um, and I have to a certain point with the podcast, but, you know, I've been on movie sets and I've prayed with actors. And set staff and directors and producers, you know, which is usually the furthest place that you find God. But every project that I've ever worked and I've been able to speak openly about my faith, which has been a fantastic thing. I've, yeah, I've spoken in front of, uh, you know, uh, earlier on this year, I spoke in front of about 50 training GPs talking to them a little bit about this and what I went through and about my life and um, what I do now. Um, I kind of felt that I was losing my voice a little because I was giving everybody a voice. Um, and I said to God, you know, I feel like I'm losing my voice. And then he started me on this journey where I'm speaking to people like you. So not only do I run my own podcast and um, write books for other people and things, um, and give them a voice. I get to give my voice to um, generous people like you um, who allow me to come on their platform and speak about my life openly and honestly um, because I wasn't an honest man. Far from it. And honesty is now 
<laughs> it feels like a curse at times. Um, but I love speaking. I'm not the most confident speaker in the world at times. Um, I'm okay at this. I'm used to it. Um, I get a little bit nervous in front of too many people, but God usually gets me through it. Um, if I'm honest, um, and yeah, it's just, I'm, I guess I'm just, I'm changing every day. And I suppose my mission is changing every day. Um, because I think that people change and um, different scenarios and different places and different people require different modes of speaking. Um, you know, this, this is the first sort of podcast that I've spoke fully about my NDE. Um, you know, I've spoken about the aftermath of it um, and the difficulties I had sort of like readjusting and, and the breakdown, but I never really spoke about going to hell because I felt like I would maybe be judged. Like people would laugh at me. Um, you know, I used to be quite a proud man. Um, my motto used to be, you know, if, if, if you, if I'm, if we're in a fight and you beat me with your fist, better come back with a bat. And if you beat me with a bat, you better come back with a knife. Beat me with a knife, you better come back with a gun. Um, because I'm just going to keep going on and on and on until one of us is dead. Um, and that's the ogre mindset that I had. Um, the violence that I lived every day. Um, and that has been changed. Um, and I'm kind of still in that world, but from a different perspective now. So I'm in that world as not only somebody that's lived it, but as an observer, um, as a teacher, I, I don't live a life of crime. I live an honest life. The people that I speak to live an honest life. Um, I speak to a lot of people in recovery trying to live an honest life. That's one thing I could never get, ever, ever, ever get. That's the biggest miracle for me, honesty. Do you think it's possible that if you survived this illness, but you didn't encounter Jesus, you would have went back to a life of gangsterism and drugs and alcohol? I think I would have, if had I have survived it and... I would have gone a little time with sobriety under my belt and I would have, on the outset, seemed like this godly man, but on the inside, I'd, been, I'd have been pulling myself apart. And then I'd convince myself that it's just a drink. A bit different this time. And that, that drink would lead, lead to more. It's just a pipe. It's just, it's just a line. It's just shot, whatever. I don't believe I'd have survived this long. Had I survived, I don't think I would have survived this long. I believe I would have been dead quite quickly by someone else's hand, by the hand of God or my own hand. I've tried to do it several times in my life. The last time I, you know, 2012, I guess it was, I was living in a crappy little flat above a carpet shop and it was just a, like a kitchenette and it had a, a little sofa and then upstairs was a sort of an attic room and that was it. I bought a gun. It's quite difficult to get a gun over here, but it's not that difficult. I bought a gun. Um, I had a shave. I had a bath. Got myself looking nice. I wrote a suicide note. Um, I loaded the gun. I sat in my chair. Um, I had the <sighs> sort of neck curtains down and because it was quite high, people couldn't really see up into the thing. And I, I sat in this wicker chair with this gun in my hand, looked out the window, put the gun against my under here, pulled the trigger and it jammed. Hmm. Checked it. 
cleaned it. Sat there. Pulled the trigger. It jammed. Checked it. Checked that I wasn't being stupid and the uh, safety catch was on, or that I wasn't catching the safety catch when I was trying to hang. And just as I was about to um, pull the trigger, my doorbell went. Um, and it was uh, one of the members of one of the local churches that I'd been going to on occasion because they would serve me coffee and they would give me sandwiches and stuff. And, you know, Christians were great with people that didn't have a lot in our town, uh, you know, in Norwich. They, they were great with people who didn't have a lot of money and they took pity and they bought you food and stuff like that. So, but he turned up and he said he, he felt God told him to turn up and I told him what was happening and he took me to the local police station and we went out the back to the amnesty box because uh, we had amnesty boxes and we cleaned the weapon down um, and popped it in the amnesty box uh, and never heard anything from it since you know and that was 2012 so you know um these are the little things that were sort of the precursor in my life to know that God was there, but I always felt distant. I kind of knew he existed, but I always felt distant. Um, you know, he, he, he took away my um, want for drugs, but I lived a, a dishonest life after that, I guess, still. Um, lying to myself and lying to my partner and just being in my own head and it was only after going to hell that I I never knew who I was really I guess being told you're adopted when you're eight it kind of put me in an existential crisis so I spent years trying to find out who I was was I the criminal was I the con man was I the bare knuckle fighter was I the man that people would run away from was I a good man? Was I a bad man? These are all things that I contemplated. I be I fell into different roles with different people. It was kind of like acting, I guess. But it's only since hell that I've been able to find a real me. I call myself a hooligan, um, WHO ligan, um, because I'm now. 45 learning who I am finally learning who I am what my place is who I am to God um, that we are um, princes and princesses of heaven um, we are meant to be there with, with God um, and I'm meant to teach I'm meant to speak I'm meant to educate I'm also meant to learn um, and I learn a lot, even speaking to other people, doing things like this. I learn a lot about other people. I've spoken to Buddhists and Muslims and people of all different, atheists and agnostics. And, you know, um, it's not something that's ever really been done in the sort of British true crime scene, but people kind of allow me to do it and listen to me do it because it's something a bit different um, and I'm something a bit different. Um, I have my mum and dad, uh, you know, my adopted mum and dad back in my life. I don't see them very often. They live hundreds of miles away from me, but, um, you know, we, we're working at a relationship. I'm a bit stubborn and my mum's a bit stubborn and, you know, I, I speak to my dad ever so often. Um, he's dealing with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. An old man, you know, he's, he's in his um, mid to late 80s. And, you know, I have that back. I have a great relationship with my wife, my kids, my stepkids. And, um, you know, I'm, people can see I'm, I'm not that person that I was. Great. The old me went to hell. The new me is something new. Jack, I'm going to switch gears with you. You have two books. One is called Personal Apocalypse, and the other one yep. is called Between the Streetlights and Red Lights. 
Do we yeah. find these on Amazon or on a yeah, website? These are that on you Amazon. Would... They're on Amazon, or um, you can uh, go to the uh, shop on my website, jwgreg.wordpress.com. And like I say, between the street lights and um, red lights, that's my second book where I um, tell people stories of escaping from uh, prostitution, sex work, and and f- labor um and things like that um my first book which is in, now it's in his second edition a personal apocalypse uh, the poetic ramblings of a troubled man um and um yeah it's basically my life as it has been um and it's me kind of trying to work out in my head what i went through at the time um I don't often do this, but if you'll allow me, um, there's a poem that opens up the book that kind of describes um, how I felt when I came out of hell and the whole sort of thing, if, if, if you'll indulge me for a moment. Sure. Um, and it's called uh, Asleep. Asleep, asleep wrapped in a blanket of darkness and I find myself falling slowly into my own personal apocalypse fighting and punching the walls of sanity not knowing who I am where I am or where where I will go from here awake awake my soul is trapped wrapped in grief and unable to weep for the fear of living to see the end of the world and death may take me again at any given moment yet I welcome her with arms wide open for my life has been nothing but a constant storm causing devastation for all those who had the misfortune to be around me. Yet this is only the beginning of the end of the world for I am cursed and I shall be forced to watch our beloved earth come to a violent end because I was the one who caused it. Awake, awake. I shall be the last to see it to watch it take its final fading dying breath as the embers and ashes slowly fade away. I shall be there, the murderer mourning, trapped in his own personal prison, built with the bars of guilt and shame, locked away in an eternal limbo as the event is played on repeat again and again and again for eternity, a punishment deserved. Asleep, asleep, the celestial father has now disowned me, for the angels did not come. God himself has succumbed to the fact that the earth shall die by my hand and my hand alone, and the devil laughs loudly standing in the corner of his playground, and still the sky is falling and complete chaos reigns on the outside. Even this dystopian world would be better than this. The four horsemen are well and truly on their way. This dying world once divided by war and famine now united in hatred of me. Yet I am unable to shed a single tear in fear that I may be seen to be weak in my final moments and my final breath will be welcomed by so many. God no longer cares and even the angels dare not stand on this unholy ground. I know all this yet I still cannot shed a single tear in regret for I am broken through and through and not even God will save me now. Fantastic job. And I, it all makes perfect sense after hearing your story. Kind of makes sense to me as well, which is why I go through it every now and again. Mm. So I have to, um, and I look at the poetry that I've written and I look at the stories that I tell, um, because I have to know that I'm telling the truth. Jack, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Don't believe the lie. We all get trapped in this lie that we're not we're not good enough or we're not wanted by a person or you know we're not good enough for this or we're not loved or liked by somebody. Um, you know, that we'll never be good enough. No matter how hard we try, it's a lie. Um, you are loved by God, by Jesus, by me. Um, Love is something 
that you have to learn to live with. You have to learn to love yourself. Um, because if you can love yourself and like yourself, then you've got a chance to be able to do something fantastic and make a statement in this world that is often confusing and, and, and difficult to get through. Um, prayer works. You might not think that it does, but it does. Even just the motion of prayer puts you in the right frame of mind, whether you're praying to God, Buddha, Allah, uh, the earth, that even, you know, that process of praying puts you in a better frame of mind and it is probably one of the best weapons in your arsenal. Um, and if you can learn to do that, you can change people's lives. You can change your life. Jack, thank you for that message. And thank you again for joining me today. Really appreciate you and I wish you the best. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.